in this video, we introduce the term affine variety. It's one of the, the most important uh, concepts in algebraic geometry. Um, so we'll define what that is, and then we'll look at some examples. Again, we've seen affine varieties before. We just never called them affine varieties, and we never worked with them the, the way that we're going to work with them here. Um, we make it a little bit more ab abstract, but with the concrete examples, you've seen many of these. Um, so this video is just going to be a definition and many familiar examples um, to help you remember what an affine variety um, truly is. So here's the definition. We want to let K be a field and we want F sub one through F sub S to be polynomials in N variables X sub one through X sub N with coefficients in the field K. Then the set V, and it's denoted this way, it looks like V of F sub one through F sub S is the set of all N tuples in N dimensional affine space, such that the F sub I are equal to zero. Um, for all um, i between 1 and s. Um, this is called the affine variety, excuse me. Defined by these S polynomial functions, F sub one through F sub S. Now I know that this looks abstract, but it's really not that bad. What this is saying is this variety V is, it's um, a set, it's a subset of n-dimensional affine space um, for which S polynomial functions are all equal to zero. Or in other words, the affine variety B is the set of solutions of the system of polynomial equations F sub one of X sub one through X sub n equals zero. And F sub two of X sub one through X sub n equals zero. And F sub three of X sub one um, through X sub n equals zero. All the way through F sub s of X sub one through X sub n equals zero. It's just a solution set. That's it. You have set a bunch of polynomials equal to zero before and solved for X and Y in calculus three. Um, when you are optimizing polynomial functions of two variables, um, when these were linear functions in X and Y or linear functions in X, Y, and Z, and you were solving um, those systems of equations, you were finding an affine variety. Um, and turns out that many of the functions that we're familiar with and relations that we're familiar with, like conics and polynomials and rational functions and the quadric surfaces that you study in calculus three, all of those are affine varieties. So even though this looks really abstract, it's something that you're very familiar with. Um, we're just giving it a new name. We're calling this an affine variety. And then we're going to look at its properties in a more abstract way. But when you think of an affine variety, it's helpful to have that concrete picture in your mind of a solution set of a system of polynomial equations. Um, so that's really all we're looking for here. An affine variety is a solution set. Now for the rest of this video, we're just gonna look at examples of these. Um, we're gonna look at many of the examples that I just talked about. And then in the next video, we'll talk about the dimensionality and applications of affine varieties um, and some important questions related to varieties um, that we'll answer in these uh, videos in this video series. So let's start with a first example. Um, it turns out that all of your conic sections 
are affine varieties. For example, if I have a V of 9x squared plus 4y squared minus 36, this is a subset of two-dimensional space or possibly higher dimensional space. Let's just say that X and Y are only variables. So it's a subset of two-dimensional space. And let's say that we are in um, two-dimensional uh, affine space where our field is the field of real numbers. And um, this is a set of all points X, Y in the X, Y plane such that this polynomial equals zero, equals zero, excuse me. It's a polynomial in two variables and it's equal to zero. Now on the surface, you might not recognize that, but hopefully you recognize that the X is squared and the Y is squared. And since you have an X squared and a Y squared and both of these terms are positive and the coefficients are different from each other, I hope you're looking at that and thinking, well, that's obviously an ellipse. Um, if it's not obvious, that's okay. Let's move that 36 to the other side by adding it to both sides. And then let's divide both sides by 36. So it's going to divide every single term here by 36. So 9 goes into 36 four times. 4 goes into 36 nine times. So this affine variety is actually the graph of this ellipse. We know from pre-calculus, that that's an ellipse centered at the origin. A, um, a squared is uh, nine, uh, B squared is four. Um, since we have this four under the X squared um, and the square root of four is two, we're gonna go plus and minus two units in the X direction and plus and minus three units in the Y direction because of three, the three squared under the nine there, or excuse me, under the Y there. Now, if you don't remember how to graph ellipses, that's okay. It's not really a big deal when you're learning algebraic geometry, but it's helpful. That's that variety. Um, if we're talking about this as a subset of two-dimensional affine space, um, this polynomial um, is related to this polynomial equation where we take that polynomial and set it equal to zero. That's exactly what we were talking about doing up here. Um, this is an affine variety for S different functions. This only has one function of two variables and the solution set is a set in two dimensional space. Notice that we are in two dimensional space and we had one function and we have um, a one-dimensional object, so something that's given by a curve. We can think of that as one-dimensional. Okay, so conics are affine varieties, and of course you could draw the other conics as well, or define other conics as well. Um, another one that's going to be very similar to that one would be this one. I just changed the sign on that four. If I take this equation, I set this polynomial equal to zero, and I say, what are all the points x, y in um, the x, y plane such that this is equal to zero? Well, when I algebraically manipulate this, I'm going to do the same thing here that I did here. Um, but the result is going to have a negative sign on the y term. And that means that the graph is very similar to this, at least when we start, but the fact that we have an X term that's positive and a Y term that's negative means that this is a hyperbola and not an ellipse. So we're gonna go uh, plus and minus two units out in the X direction, plus and minus three units out in the Y direction from zero, zero, which is the center. And then when y equals zero, we see that x is equal to plus or minus two. So those are two points on our graph. And if I draw uh, dotted lines or asymptotes through those 
corners of our um, rectangle there, we get something that looks like this. And that's a hyperbola. Um, so hyperbolas um, are affine varieties. Ellipses are affine varieties. I think that you can tell um, that a parabola would obviously be an affine variety. Um, this is just our traditional parabola in two dimensional space. Y minus X squared equals zero can be rearranged to give us y equals x squared. And so that variety looks like that parabola that we're all comfortable with that we've studied plenty in our pre-calculus type classes. Um, so all of these are affine varieties. Conics are affine varieties. And pretty much any polynomial is an affine variety. I say any, pretty much any polynomial. All polynomials um, are affine varieties. And if you're, you're thinking Okay, let's say I have something like this. Well, that's a cubic polynomial in one variable. Um, well, I can define an affine variety from that cubic polynomial this way. Let's just subtract this guy from both sides. And if we want, we could distribute there so you're more likely to actually see it looking something like this. This would be x cubed minus four x. Distribute the negative. Just a little algebra, the kind of algebra that we teach um, at TCC. Um, so like not, not abstract algebra, um, but just sort of algebraic manipulation. Um, so this is the same as that. And this is a set in two dimensional space. So we had a polynomial in one variable. When I graph it, I graph it in two dimensional space because I need a variable or I need, yeah, I need a variable for the output and the variable for the input. And this is defined by this polynomial equation. So I have y minus x cubed plus four x is equal to zero. The solution set of that in two-dimensional space is our affine variety. So we have y equals x cubed plus 4x. And we can see from this factored form that this is equal to 0 when x equals 2, negative 2, or 0. And we know that the basic shape is going to be something like this. Um, so that's the graph of that affine variety. Now, rational functions are also affine varieties. Now remember, a rational function is just a polynomial over a polynomial. And you might think, Hmm, how can that be an affine variety? Well, I think it's pretty easy to see that if you take that and you multiply both sides by g of x and you subtract f of x from both sides, you get that. And if f and g are polynomials, g of x times y is a polynomial in two variables. If I take that and I subtract that polynomial, I still have a polynomial. So this is a polynomial. So the solution set of this equation is the same as the solution set of that equation. So when I graph this rational function, I'm really graphing the affine variety that is defined by this rational function over here. So just to give us a very simple example, one that's very easy for, for me to graph, um, I know what y equals uh, one over x squared looks like. We could take that and we could rearrange it by multiplying both sides by x squared and then subtracting one from both sides. So this rational function or the graph of this rational function is the solution set to the affine variety um, defined by this polynomial in two variables. So I've got a, a, a rational function in one variable that becomes a polynomial in two variables. So 
So it's the set of all points in two dimensional space such that x squared y minus one is equal to zero. And through algebraic manipulation, you can show that y would equal one over x squared there. So this affine variety just looks like that. Easy breezy, very nice, very easy. Now, if you're looking at for more variables, um, you can always go to calculus three and think about quadric surfaces. So quadric surfaces like x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals nine. That's a sphere of radius three centered at the origin. Well, that is equivalent to this equation, which means that when I graph that sphere of radius three centered at the origin, and that's not a solid sphere, that's just sort of the outside. If I took a basketball and I just took off the, the cover of that basketball, not the inside, that would be the sphere that we're talking about. Um, well, this is just a polynomial in x, y, and z set equal to zero. So um, v of x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus nine, that's going to be the set of all ordered triples in three-dimensional space such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus nine equals zero. And that gives us that sphere. Um, so you can see so many of the functions that you've already studied um, and their graphs uh, can be um, defined um, as affine varieties. Affine varieties are solution sets of a system of polynomial equations. If you can write the function defining some graph or the relation defining some graph, um, as a polynomial set equal to zero, well, then you can think of that as the solution set of, of some polynomial equation. And as a solution set of a polynomial equation, it's an example of an affine variety. So when you think of a variety, I don't want you to think of some abstract um, algebra object. I just want you to think, Oh, well, it's just a solution set to a system of polynomial equations. I'm familiar with that because I've taken calculus three, probably. Most people um, that are interested in this video probably have. Um, so that's an example of a variety. Here's another one. If I have x squared plus y squared minus z squared. Well, that's going to be the set of all ordered triples in three dimensional space. We're looking at three-dimensional affine space where our field is the field of real numbers, where x squared or plus y squared minus z squared is equal to zero. And hopefully you recognize that from multivariable calculus. Sometimes you see it written like that. Sometimes you see it written like this. That's a cone that opens around the um, z-axis Got one side opening up, the other side opening down. Also in three dimensional space. Um, so this sphere is an affine variety defined by a single function of three variables. This cone is an affine variety um, defined by a single polynomial function of three variables. Now, if you're thinking of oh, polynomials don't have solutions, you're right. Polynomials don't have solutions. But affine varieties are solution sets of polynomial equations. So the polynomials define the variety, but they define the variety in the sense that you're setting each of the polynomials in the variety equal to zero, and then you're looking for where all of those equations are satisfied. Now, pretty much every example I just did involved one equation. We've got one equation here, which gave us that polynomial. We've got one equation here, which gave us that graph of a rational function. 
uh, one equation here and one equation here. So we have this surface and this surface. And then we had the two conics that we started with. Um, but we could have more than one equation. And there's a great example in this book, Ideals, Varieties, and Algorithms by Cox, Little, and O'Shea. Um, it's called the twisted cubic. And basically what that is, it's the intersection of two surfaces. So you're going to take the surface given by y minus x squared equals zero, and you're going to take the surface given by z minus x cubed equals zero, and you're going to see where they intersect. Since these are polynomials in three variables, we can think of this variety as a subset of three-dimensional affine space. And let's say that our field is the field of real numbers. Well, we want both of these to be zero at the same time. So again, what we're saying is we're looking at this surface, y equals x squared in three-dimensional space, and this surface, z equals x cubed in three-dimensional space, and we're seeing where those overlap. Now, this one is so hard for me to draw that I'm going to use Calcplot 3D to sketch it for us, um, because then it's going to be really easy to see where these two surfaces overlap. Um, this one, y equals x squared, actually I could draw this one. This is my x-axis, this is my y-axis, and this is my z-axis. y equals x squared looks like a parabola in the x-y plane, but then x, or then z, excuse me, is free to be anything. So when x equals zero, y equals zero, but z can be anything. So this entire z axis um, is part of this as well. Basically what we're gonna see is like exactly the same parabola up here. I didn't do a very good job drawing it, but you get the idea. There's like part of the parabola that's closest to us and there's part of the parabola that's behind us. That's one of our surfaces. Now we want to take that and we want to intersect it with z equals x cubed. Now I'm going to imagine taking my three-dimensional coordinate system and sort of turning it so that my z-axis is here and my x-axis is here and my y-axis is coming straight out of the page, coming at you. Um, in that case, z equals x cubed is going to look kind of like this. If, if it's flipped from what you're used to, it's because the positive x-axis is over here. And the reason I put the positive x-axis over here is because we're working with a right-handed coordinate system. Because that's what it would look like if I, I were standing over here on the y-axis and looking. Um, the x-axis would be to my left rather than being to my right. Um, so that's what z equals x cubed looks like. But y is free to be anything. So I've got this surface that's sort of coming out of the page you have that bookmark right here. And it has that shape. And I'm looking at where that surface that has that shape intersects with that surface. And that's going to give us what we call the twisted cubic. And again, I'm going to show you on um, Calcplot 3D because it makes it easier to see. Now, this is the Calcplot 3D website. If you just search for Calcplot 3D, you'll find this. Um, I think his name is Paul Seberger at Monroe Community College. He got an NSF grant to create this for probably his Calculus 3 students. Um, but this allows you to graph um, various surfaces and curves and vector fields and all kinds of objects that you might want to visualize in Calculus 3. Um, now, one of ours was z equals x cubed. So let's, let's graph that. So that's what I meant. <laughs> I was trying to draw that on my paper, my 2D piece of paper, as you see it over here. I could draw it in the x, z plane like that version, but it's really hard to draw that dimension where the y is coming out at you. Um, so yeah, now that, and that's the negative z axis below. Okay, so we've got that. And we wanna see where that intersects with um, this parabolic cylinder, uh, y equals x squared. So y is equal to x squared and z is free to be anything. So what I want is y to be a function of x and z and I'll want y equals x squared there. And we've got that. So now you see that uh, 
parabolic surface. Let's just get rid of the z equals x cubed for a minute. So you see uh, y equals x squared down there in the xy plane. Z is free to be anything. And then we've got this one at the same time. Now if you're saying, what's a twisted cubic? The twisted cubic, oh, let's stop. The twisted cubic is right here. It's the line of intersection where this um, cubic surface, z equals x cubed, and this parabolic surface, y equals x squared, um, intersect. Now it's a little bit easier to see why they call it the twisted cubic if you're looking at it from like a position where x and y and z are all positive. You see how it's like a cubic function, but it's sort of twisted because of the intersection with y equals x squared. I hope you can see that. So I've got this cubic function, but it's it's twisted because of, of that intersection. So the affine variety is not these two surfaces together. The affine variety is the points of intersection. It's that seam right there. Um, and we'll be able to sketch that when we learn how to parameterize um, these guys a little bit later. Uh, sorry, I got to change the angle so I can get my z-axis, my x-axis sort of coming out at us. Nope, there we go. There's the y-axis over there. Trying to make it look more like the, the orientation that we're accustomed to from Calc 3, but it's a little bit hard to do. You've got your y-axis here, your x-axis there, and your z-axis is going straight up and down. Okay. Um, so that's the twisted cubic. Um, so it is a curve of intersection between a surface that looks like this and a surface that looks like that. Um, so we have, we're in three dimensional space. We've got two equations. And because we had two equations, um, well, if I had one equation, I would have a surface, which is 2D. Um, this is a 2D object, two dimensional object, a surface. This one's a two dimensional object, also a surface, even though I was uh, having trouble drawing it. Um, we could try. So we would have something that looks like this. And then it's also going to go sort of behind the y axis over there. Really hard to draw in 2D. Um, but that's your cubic, kind of. <laughs> and that's sort of Real, like really bad art. You have to imagine it. Um, that's why CalCplot 3D was so much better um, at, at visualizing this for us. But where this um, cubic surface intersects with this parabolic surface, we get a curve. We get a curve of intersection. So we went from some uh, equations that were defined in terms of three variables, which gave us surfaces, which are sort of two-dimensional objects, and then we found that the intersection of two two-dimensional objects and we got a one-dimensional object. That's insightful. You might think, hmm, does that always hold? Is that how this always works? And we're going to answer um, many of those questions as we continue to study algebraic geometry. Um, another example um, of affine varieties that, that I mentioned at the very beginning is from linear algebra, uh, linear varieties. Uh, so um, even if you haven't had linear algebra, um, if you've had just regular college algebra or algebra in high school, if you've ever seen a system of two equations and two unknowns and you were asked to solve it, um, then you were asked to find the solution set of a linear variety. So I've got two equations and two unknowns here. I could um, set both of those equations equal to zero by subtracting the nine from both sides of that second equation. So the solution set of this is the variety defined by the two polynomial functions, two x plus y and five x minus two y minus nine so this is the set of all points x, y, 
in two dimensional space such that these two equations are true. 2x plus y equals zero and uh, 5x minus 2y um, equals nine if we take this rearranged version. Now you can look at those two lines and you probably already know um, what's gonna happen. Um, this line, just by looking at the coefficients, you can tell that this line is not parallel to this line. Um, since the two lines are not parallel to each other, you're not looking at a case where the lines either never intersect or they're exactly the same line. Um, since they're not, there are two lines that are not parallel to each other, you probably have intuition that there's gonna be one point where those two lines intersect and your, inter um, and your intuition is correct. So let's see, y equals, um, or two x plus y equals zero means that y equals negative two x. So you start here, you can go down um, two and over one. So you have that. Or if you want to take this equation and solve it for y, you can have 5x minus 9 equals 2y. So y is equal to 5 over 2 times x minus 9 over 2. Um, so that means when x equals 0, uh, y is a negative 9 over 2. So that's uh, negative 4 and a half. So I'm going to go down 4 there's negative five, go to four and a half. And then we're gonna go up five and over two. So if we go up five and over two, we end up right here. And if I draw a line through those two points, hmm, it looks like this point, x equals one, y equals negative two, may be the solution set. If I'm just trying to find the solution set by graphing, I can always check. So that the question is, is this variety equal to this single point? Well, if I plug in one and negative two here, do I get zero? Yes. If I plug in one for X and negative two for Y, do I get nine? Yes, five plus four is nine. Um, so this variety defined by these two linear equations is a single point in two dimensional space, two-dimensional affine space, and it's the point um, x equals one, y equals negative two. Um, so that's an example. Now with these examples from linear algebra or even just college algebra, high school algebra, um, you know that varieties will, will sometimes be empty sets because if I gave you this variety And I said, where are, where are these two equations both satisfied at the same time? Tell me where that, that, that's true. Well, remember what this variety is. It's the set of all points x, y in two dimensional affine space where just for example, um, our field is the field of real numbers. And now I want two x plus y to equal zero. And at the same time, I want two x plus y minus five to equal zero. If I take that one and add five to both sides, I'm asking for something that's impossible. I want two X plus Y to equal zero and I want two X plus Y to equal five. Well, five doesn't equal zero, so that can't happen. Um, so this affine variety is empty. If you have two equations that can never be satisfied at the same time, your affine variety may not have any points in it. And um, we would say that the system of equations is inconsistent. So when we talk about varieties that are empty sets, we're saying that this corresponding so system of polynomial equations is an inconsistent system. This is a consistent system. It has a single solution. Now you could also have a consistent system with infinitely many solutions. If I had two X plus Y as my first polynomial and four X plus two Y as my second polynomial, well, that's going to give me the same line. 
This is a set of all points x, y in two dimensional space, such that 2x plus y equals zero and 4x plus 2y equals zero. I kind of already knew that 4x plus 2y was going to be zero because if I take this equation and I double it, I get this one. So this equation is not really telling me anything new. So this graph is a single line. It's y equals negative 2x. Looks like that. Even though it looks like it's defined by two polynomials, there's one polynomial there that's not giving me any new information. It's redundant. Um, so we can have a single solution. We have no solutions. We can have infinitely many solutions. And those infinitely many solutions may lie on a line or a surface or a curve where surfaces intersect. Um, many things like that. Now, we've just looked at some very simple systems of linear equations, um, but we could look at three equations with three unknowns. We could look at two equations with three unknowns. We could look at 15 equations with um, 20 unknowns. Um, and all of that is something that you study in linear algebra. Um, but my point here is that varieties can be empty. And whenever you have a system of equations, just linear equations, so a sub 1, 1 times x sub 1, 1 plus a sub 1, 2 times x sub 1, 2, and a sub 1, n times x sub 1, n equals 0. And then you have another one and another one. Well, that is a system of equations, or maybe this equals b sub 1 over here. Well, if you subtract all those b's from that side and you put them on the other side, what you have is um, a system of linear equations. And if you're looking for the solution of that system of linear equations, what you're looking for is an, a particular affine variety. And that affine variety may have um, zero dimension, which means that it's, it's, um, it's a finite number of points. Each point is zero dimensional. A set of points is zero dimensional. Or you might have something that's one dimensional. So, you know, uh, all those equations may be satisfied for a set of points that lies along a curve. Or you might have something that's two dimensional or three dimensional or 15 dimensional. Um, it just really depends. Uh, we're gonna talk more about dimensionality in the next video, but I hope you see now um, the affine varieties are sort of nothing to be afraid of. They are familiar. Um, the terminology is just different. When you see the word variety or you see V of F sub one through F sub S, all it means is that you're looking for a solution of a system of polynomial equations. And all you do to find that system is you take the polynomials that they gave you, you set them all equal to zero, and then you try to solve for x sub one through x sub n. Um, if you can solve for those, um, if there is a finite number of points there and you can solve for those, usually we try to solve for those. Um, and if there's not a finite number of points, maybe there's infinitely many points that lie along a curve like this, sometimes you try to graph it to visualize what's going on. Um, kind of like we did here with this surface and this surface, you try to graph them and, and understand what the solution set would look like uh, for a solution um, or for a set of points that satisfies this system of equations, this polynomial set equal to zero and this polynomial set equal to zero. Um, and of course there are just who knows how many applications of linear algebra. Um, so yeah. Um, some common affine varieties are conics, polynomial functions, rational functions, quadric surfaces, um, intersections of surfaces, um, and the linear varieties that we studied in, in linear algebra. And again, you might have an inconsistent system of equations, so it's possible that a variety can be empty. Next time, we'll talk about dimensionality of varieties um, and applications of varieties and finite units and unions, excuse me, and intersections of varieties.